All right, it's been a minute, guys, firing up a ship-chasing stream for the first time in a little bit. We got the full crew here, going to catch up on all kinds of stuff. We, of course, have the Combine in the books. Free agency is already starting to get underway. We'll talk about that. Both Pat and Gretch have been in the lab doing uh, various kinds of fantasy research, so we will share what we all have been up to of late. This is Ship Chasing. Let's roll the clip. Pat Fryer Helmo. <laughs> this is what? This is what I'm hot. Anita Hanjob. Fix your sight. Jamar. Alpha play chase. <laughs> Are you <laughs> kidding me? Can you you story? You can't handle the heat. See, it looks like we're finally at this point. You're right. <laughs> it's this funny thing where i feel like i haven't seen or talked to you guys in a while but i've been like the podcast meme where i've listened to both of you uh do some podcasting since then i actually just listened to gretchen bind for so it feels like i've been hanging out with you guys even though i haven't <laughs> i listened to pat's um uh, a couple of his combine, a couple of his prospect stuff as well. Uh, I flew down to Arizona for a couple of days, visited my brother. I don't do a lot of podcasting because I don't like, I don't leave the house <laughs> like as a dad. Like I work from home and then I'm with the kids a lot. But when I was traveling, I, I got some of Pat's and I felt the same way. I was like, hey, it's cool to be here. Pat's <laughs> 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 wow. What's what's new with you, Pat? You you deep in the uh, in the lab here with all the rookies? I am. I did the same thing. I listened to some of uh, your your appearance with Neil. Um, oh, nice. Pete, I didn't check out the. When did you record with Bind for? I missed that. Was that today? That was Gretch just recorded. No, no, I know Gretch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, I think he just released okay. it today. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, in the lab, um, writing up, I. I about finished with the first part of my quarterback write-ups um so probably drop that early next week um yeah been uh working on dynasty ranks best ball ranks all that stuff so this is the i mean this is the first year right where <laughs> you've been and we collectively have been processing the rookie class through the best ball lens before the dynasty lens, which is hilarious because it was always dynasty, yeah. best ball, then redraft. That was the collective rookie progression. And this year, best ball flip dynasty in the order. Yeah, 100%. I mean, they didn't give us any time. They, <laughs> they didn't give us any break the at all. Best ball takeover is complete, man. Dynasty's down bad. <laughs> I, am, I have no interest in, like, in dynasty at this stage of my life. <laughs> The dynasty I, apparently is thriving. I was talking to Josh um, of the Buckeye Boomers, and he's you know he's deep in the weeds in these like various league types, and telling me kind of like the way things are really shifting towards elite wide receivers and some of these superflex leagues. So it is interesting. I mean, you know, I'm like, man, I kind of need to. I, I don't want to become like a dynasty boomer here. You know what I mean? I gotta, I gotta make sure <laughs> I'm aware of the of the trends. If you poke around on YouTube, like some of the dynasty shows are absolutely crushing. And if you think about it, like pound for pound, they're definitely punching above their weight class. There's no influx of underdog money, like fueling, like all kinds of, you know, best ball discourse, right? Like what is, what is propelling dynasty content? It's oh, just love playing sickos. It. Yeah. Just, just pure love sickos. for it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, no, the, I mean, dynasty's always going to have that. Yeah. The thing with dynasty though, is like, it's so sick that they can't like dynasty can't even like agree on like a league type yeah you know what i mean much less like one hosting platform to be you know the platform i guess sleepers maybe making a play but you know it's like it's like oh dude you don't play in a 36 roster honestly <laughs> like you don't fucking play dynasty <laughs> Great. I just realized a really funny snake eating its tail moment uh, that I have to tell you about. So I had hit you up. So I got a trade offer in one of the dynasty leagues that Leone runs. It's a, um, we did it during like the quarantine stuff and, you know, uh, best ball dynasty league. I'm not a, that active of a manager, but I get a trade offer involving my 107 and Superflex in JSN. And so my first thing is like, I, I don't have a good frame of reference for this right now. So I just like quickly pinged Pat. I was like, what, how, how do you, how do you have this? And you gave me your thoughts. Then I was listening to your podcast with Davis where you guys were breaking down 
basically the exact same yeah, scenario exactly. how you would value jsn and it was from drewby and i'm like i guarantee he fucking listened to that <laughs> podcast yeah. and it was like i should sell jsn for the 107 and then i go to you for you to say yeah don't do that about the 110 and then i sent him back a trade offer for something you would more approve so it was me and drewby <laughs> Just like bouncing your dynasty valuations off of each other. Like, what the fuck are we doing? <laughs> that's the, that's my issue with dynasty is you're only playing with sickos. Like all the leagues I'm in are all the other really like engaged people. It's and I'm not going to outwork you. <laughs> well, yeah. I was like, in Drewby's like, I mean, like not saying he's a bad manager, but I don't consider him the most plugged in dynasty mind. I'm like, this seems like a fucking shady ass type of Sean like <laughs> offer. Yeah. And then I hear you guys are fucking spitballing the same stuff on the podcast. <laughs> it's also like Drewby. You think I'm not going to listen to this? Come on. Where's the, where's the edge too? Like what, what are you going to get out of that? Like you. That's that's my thing with Dynasty. You put in so many hours and so much time. And I mean, I'm not trying to hate on it. There's lots of people who really love it. It's never been my favorite. I, I came up as a redraft guy for a long time. I didn't start playing Dynasty until I was doing content in like 2016. I started playing Dynasty. Um, so I'm not like a, one of these. Some people have been playing Dynasty for 20 years and they love it. And I get it. I'm not trying to hate on that. But when you play in these leagues with other people who are plugged in, you're all just going off the same like analysis and same strategies and same player types. You're all trying to buy picks. You're all trying to get younger. You're all trying to do the same shit. It's like, it's so hard to do anything. And I, I do think for me, like my gateway into becoming obsessed with fantasy was, was through dynasty. Like I did yeah, my first too. dynasty startup in 2014, obviously one of the best draft classes ever, like shooting fish in a barrel, drafting Brandon cooks and Allen Robinson. And I'm like, dude, this is fucking fun, man. Whereas now people can get red pilled on fantasy through best ball. And they're like, I don't even have to deal with that. Whereas like, I think a lot of us still have a nostalgia factor to following in love with like, Hey, all the normies just playing their redraft league, but I'm playing right. dynasty year round, man. No, for sure. That was, I mean, because then, you know, that was how I got obsessed with all the rookie stuff. You got to, you got to know the rookies coming in. I do think Dynasty, I feel like I've learned more from Dynasty than Redraft in a way. Cause there's like, that makes sense. You know, there's like a lot of lessons about kind of the way the market reacts to stuff <clears throat> and sort of your own, you're kind of tracking your own feelings on players in a way, you know, over time in a more like concrete way. You can't lie to yourself as much, you know, it's like, no, no. No, you really liked Rashad Bateman a lot. Look at the trades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's probably why I like redraft because you can let yourself off the hook in November, yeah. basically, and just like be done with it until like the next July. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll just start over. Like, here's no, it's okay. kinder. It's definitely like Diners, Dynasty is a harsher format, but um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, one thing I'll say for Dynasty, like, I I do like it's probably the the format where I like the kind of public leagues the most like in best ball or like less like the less sharper the better you know in best ball sometimes like i don't mind it being a sharp room because everyone's kind of staying in their own lane a little bit um but in dynasty like if people think differently from you it makes the league so much more like alive you know mm -hmm. everyone's willing to trade with one another because not everyone's trying to do the same thing so it's like the industry leagues are some of the worst dynasty leagues because everyone's like, which is all I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there's it, like that's a it's a good spot. I, I'm in some FFPC like you know kind of more just like public dynasty leagues that way, and it's they're pretty fun. It's not my favorite format because they cut you cut down to like 16 players in the off season, so it's like borderline keeper league. But there is there's like something to be said for just not being in leagues with people who think exactly like you do. It it has been fun to watch the kind of dynasty and best ball, you know, strategy and form each other, you know, with how we, you know, people slowly realizing how important um, some might even say the only thing that matters uh, the very end of the season with those. And that's like the whole game you're playing with dynasty. Oh, too. And one, of the, <laughs> one of the things you always talk about with dynasty is like, you don't even have to hit on the pick because you have these cell yeah. windows at yeah. the end of the year. And one thing that recently crystallized for me too, it's like one of the reasons you have those cell windows, one, people are just willing to like completely martingale like players they like, but also you generally see those signs of life that just smidge of opportunity 
at the end of the rookie year in the same way we're banking on the Tyquan Thornton catch, the A.T. Perry catch. Yeah, like yeah. That helps create that window in Dynasty as much as it does give your best ball team a spike week. Yeah. the So Sack was saying, this was a no-no pod, um, but he made a point the other day. He was like, if we're trying to like, if you were trying to like figure out like what you're even optimizing for, like if you were just saying like, what are, what are like best ball rankings for, you know, best ball mania? Like what are we sort of gunning for? You're almost trying to predict dynasty rankings heading into week 17. <laughs> like what are the dynasty rankings going to look like that week? And then you'd want all those players, you know, it's like a yeah. weird, they're actually somewhat connected because of how important the late season is in best ball. Yeah. And I was thinking about that, Gretch. You you had some uh, some comments on your show with Bime Four too, where people are still stuck in like these game types are so different. And while there's overlaps, like not realizing like best ball specifically, the tournament structures are like an entirely different game format. And I think sometimes people want to apply it like they do Dynasty. Like I've got my QB two and Superflex locked in for ten years, and it's like that's okay, that actually could be how it works. It's super flex dynasty. <laughs> but in best ball, it's like you just want one spike week from that 15th round pick and you are doing cartwheels. Yeah. Exactly. That was a huge lesson for me uh, in best ball, by the way, as far as like it being early March and we can talk about like some lessons learned in 2023 and stuff. Guys that I was not in on last year um, because of like – my frame, like my mental frame, especially with wide receivers in, in the first like five, seven rounds, is always like I need them to be potential league winners. And in the B potential, like Sean's old thing was the six top 15 wide receivers. I need them to be that good, right? Just absolutely elite. I remember with DJ Moore, we talked about him a lot last year. And I talked about, I by the end of the, the offseason, I was like, I think he's going to be a small win. And I he was more than a small win. But I do think it's it's notable that he had, I think, like nine single-digit half PPR games. Yeah. And then he had some monster games, which was huge, obviously. But that's that's the point I'm getting at is a small win for the most part and then a big Week 17, which DJ Moore had, is a huge win in best ball. Amari Cooper is the other one, another guy where I was like, this guy can't be a top five overall wide receiver. But then in Week 16, he has the monster spike week. And throughout the year, he's he has a good season. He, I mean, like, I didn't think what Amari Cooper did in 2023 he couldn't do, but I didn't want to draft him. And all you have to do is that and then have the spike. I don't know. There's Those are the two examples yeah. that I came to in the last few days when I was doing some other work where I was like, that I, I got to – it was more crystallizing for me about, like, anybody can be the guy you need. Like, if you think he can be a small win, you should take him in best ball because he could have the spike week in addition to being a small win yeah. in the regular season, and that's huge. Yeah, so especially wide receiver, I think. So it's interesting because to me, Dynasty is a floor game. And people tend to play it as a ceiling game, but it's a floor game. The in Dynasty, we're all on boats and they're all sinking. <laughs> and your job is to is to find boats that are sinking at slower rates. Because every year rookies picks come in. Rookie picks represent a huge portion of the trade of like the available capital in that league. And it's just added to the pot. And everyone else's value goes down. Every other asset that you have loses value on average every single year. Damn, that's forever. a good way of putting that. So like that. You, you need to be very conscious of your floor. And if you're taking, you have to take on risk sometimes, but I think you want to be intentional about that. Redraft is a ceiling game where there's the waiver wire. You're going to have, you're going to have chances to patch holes. You need to find the guys that are going to fucking explode and change the league that year. And then after the league, after that year ends, if you screwed it up real bad, oh well, you're going to do a new redraft the next year. It doesn't matter. You don't have any consequences. You're not going to lose. And if that player goes from like Tony Pollard 2022 to Tony Pollard 2023, yeah. now he's a second round pick, you don't have to take you just him. Don't take him. You yeah. just don't take him. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Best ball is a floor and ceiling game. And and I think the floor the, the floor part you're talking about, we gotta stack bets. We gotta stack bets and getting a small win and then another small win and then another small win is pretty fucking awesome. You also do, do have to find the guys who give you the huge wins. You have to find the guys who give you the spike weeks for free at the end. So that ceiling is still really important to keep in mind too. But I think that I mean to me, that's why best ball ends up being so fun, specifically the, the tournament style where you have to really think about floor and ceiling. You can't ignore either. Yeah, or another way to put it is it's like you are condensing 
uh, a dynasty season and a redraft season into one season. Like that's what best ball is where it's like, you're playing your regular season at the start. You're playing dynasty at the end of it too, yeah. where, but it's all just, yeah. Hyper yeah. That's that is. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a really interesting way to think about it. Uh, Dr. Evil in the chat, uh, quoting Pat, we are all sinking boats here. I thought this would be a more uplifting <laughs> than watching the state of the union address. <laughs> that's my life, dude. I've been trying to work out and I keep, my calves keep cramping so bad and like getting strained. And I just been talking to my wife about this. I'm like, I'm a sinking boat. Like I'm, I'm 36. <laughs> like I can't even, I it used to be, I was talking to Brian for about this before our show. Like we're both like going through this a little bit. It used to be like, I sucked at cardio. I didn't, I never liked cardio. I was, was like, I played sports to get my exercise. Yeah, that's, I, didn't that's, run. I, need, I need to feel the competition. Right. That's exactly how me and Brian like are too. But I'm trying as I get older, I'm trying to 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 adjust in that and I'm doing better at it. But it used to be when I tried to do cardio, it would be like my heart and lungs and stuff would get tired and I, I wouldn't be able to push myself anymore. Now my body can't hold up long enough for my heart and lungs to get tired. Like my fucking calves <laughs> keep giving out. I got three quarters of a mile on a jog the other day and my calf like just died. And I'm like, I gotta limp back to my house. Like this fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i'm sure later on this stream we'll call some 26 year old nfl player completely washed up and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fair. oh man what uh what gretch i know you uh you put out your one of your first tprr uh post today did you have any kind of fun initial takeaways from that one well i was just working on the second one before the show i was at my desk here pounding away i think i have i'm doing them two divisions at a time so eight teams i think i've i was on the seventh team um so that'll i might send that out tonight or, or tomorrow morning nice um that's the one that's freshest on my mind when you said a minute ago about martingaling um i mean like how are we not going to be back in on kyle pitts guys oh I, i'm definitely back in he slowly yeah, just raised okay. up the rankings Best ball, so I'll just go in and tinker and be like, I'm a, 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 a little more. <laughs> I mean, so he played hurt last year. His target spot run was still like it wasn't as good as his last two years, but 18.5% still good for a tight end, especially one with an ADOT that was like 12 plus, which he has been all three years. So now through three years, he has a target spot run of 22%, an ADOT over 12, which is not just high for a tight end, it's above average for a wide receiver. Yeah, that's high. There's He's only. There's only 22 players in the NFL last season. I have my weighted targets per out run stat that takes the targets per out run and then adds air yards. Cal Pitts has run 1,185 routes in his three seasons, right? And most of that has felt like a disappointment. There's only 20 – his career weighted targets per out run over those 1,185 routes is 0 0.60. To put that in context, there's only 22 players in the NFL last season. Zero of them were tight ends that ran at least 100 routes and had a higher weighted targets per run in just the one season last year, which is he's done it over a large sample now. Yeah, he's been inefficient. Yeah, his offenses have been super low volume. But they went and got Zach Robinson, who was talking about Matthew Stafford being like the quintessential quarterback. They're going to get a drop back passer. Like I don't – I've been hearing like some Russell Wilson stuff. I don't think that's going to happen. The Justin Fields stuff never no, they, makes sense. It's all it's, cousins. They want cousins bad. They want cousins. It's I'm hook, line, and sinker on that. I think he's going to land there. I don't think the – Vikings want to keep him. I think they're going to probably move on. I think they're ready. You know, I think they want to he, keep him, but he wants he wants to get paid with the so amount of money. In, he, right? He they've done they've done the money. they've done the huge percent of the cap to Kirk Cousins thing for enough years. I think they're done with that. And so, yeah. and Atlanta is in the perfect spot where they're like, well, we just want competent quarterback play, and their new coaching staff wants a drop back passer. Ownership's like, yeah, we haven't had a drop back passer since Matt Ryan left, and everything else has worked, you know, terribly. That's what's going to happen. I mean, like Kirk Cousins is going to land it. They're going to throw 150 more passes this year. The the per route run stuff on him and on Drake London, for the record, wide receiver 26 on early underdog stuff. Like, you have to be loading up on those guys right now. Yeah, I've yeah. been, he's another guy moving up a bit. Um, I don't have him a ton ahead of ADP, Drake London, but we're, no, actually, we, we've gotten pretty far ahead. We have him at 30, and he's still at 37 overall. I mean, like one that jumps out to me and just cover your ears, London. Man. But I mean, like Dalton Kincaid going almost overall picks then, not, ahead not of. Not What's oh. that? 
No, go. That's higher than I thought it was. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no, I'm just saying. Like, I think some of the ones that stand out to me, ADP wise, like I understand why Ingram and Najoku are going ahead of pitch, just what they did at the end of last year specifically. I think like the Kincaid and Bowers ones are the real interesting ones relative to Kyle Pitts. Because like a lot of these other guys, you know what you're going to get. Even George Kittle, you kind of know what you're going to get. But like, how do you benchmark Kyle Pitts against Dalton Kincaid and Brock Bowers? Because those are like the mystery boxes. The one thing I'm still concerned about with Pitts is that he's a bad blocker. And that's that's the thing, you know, like last year I wrote the article on um, paper play action participation rate um, and just how it correlates to scoring touchdowns. Uh, because if, if tight ends are out there run blocking, tight ends tend to get a lot of, you know, targets around the goal line since they're big dudes. Uh, but if you're not out there for play action stuff or just, you know, run look stuff, that can really hurt your touchdown upside. And yeah. we've seen Kyle Pitts struggle with that. Um that so my cheap. thought, I, I think that's a great point, but my thought on that is that Arthur Smith went and got John Smith because he wanted that type of tight end, right? But he really should have just play, been playing Kyle Pitts as a wide receiver. And right. we also know that freak score for wide receivers like from way back in the road of his days. Like That's why I thought Kyle Pitts was going to have a high touchdown rate coming out because he's this big athletic freak. Amazing. Like Those guys tend to – so if he's just playing wide receiver, which – I mean, I think a competent coaching staff would want him on the field in the red zone split out if he can't block, right? Like, why would you take him off the field? That's only Arthur Smith would do that. Right? It, it is strange, but yeah, I mean, it's you you do rarely see tight ends that don't leave the field. Like, even the Darren Waller types, they still don't have route participation of like 95%, like an elite wide receiver. They tend to be more like 80, 85%. So I don't know. I would. I think that's probably still going to be something we are ultimately finding disappointing relative to like the upside of other tight ends. Um, yeah. You know, it's just kind of part of part of his deal, I think. But we're going to find it a lot more appealing if they're throwing way, way more. I mean, so, yeah, I actually just braced him up a little bit more. Um, well, and that, I mean, I'm going to be in even- his competition for uh, additional tight end snaps are like, who is he losing tight end snaps to now too, right? Like whoever that is, is going to be less of a threat than John who was. Right. I think the paper thing is really, really interesting. I thought about it a lot this year, Pat, after you wrote about that, I think it was one of the best pieces of unique analysis in the fantasy space in the 2023 season. Um, and I, I thought about it a ton. Kyle Pitts is the one guy that I'm like, I st- I, he's not a tight end, right? Like, I mean, that's right. what I keep doing. Like, does it does it not fit for him? It, it fits for him with Arthur Smith because Arthur Smith would take him off the field because Arthur Smith is it's giant brain. <laughs> but <laughs> I would think that the new coaching staff is going to come in and be like, we have this weapon and we think of him as a weapon. And even if we don't trust him in run formations and then to set up the play action pass block stuff, then we just put him out wide a lot, you know? I mean – yeah, he's helped by the fact they don't have anybody, you know. Um, right. I was listening to, yeah, I mean, obviously they have London, but they don't have anybody else that you would like. It would make a lot of sense to use him as a big wide receiver split out. If they were to draft someone, though, then that's you know, he's I, he's still at risk of being odd man out on the on the play action stuff if they have a legitimate secondary wide receiver, which they currently don't. Right, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, any any thoughts on those other guys though? The the Kincaid and Bowers, maybe Bowers if we want to skew toward rookies right now. Bowers is interesting to me. Where this dude, I think he, I mean it's you know hindsight maybe, but I think he's a better prospect than Pitts. Um, he has a different setup than Pitts, where Pitts had the awesome final season, but was kind of a one year wonder in terms of his production. Um, three-year player Bowers also a three-year player came in with a 29% dominator rating I believe that was his peak um yeah 29% then 22% 26% to close out but he played 14 games as a true freshman had 882 yards and 13 touchdowns uh he was productive his entire college career he's a bit undersized but he was a really good run blocker so I'm not as worried about you know him leaving the field um I do think he'll probably run a lot of routes out of the slot. He ran like half of his routes out of the slot at Georgia. 
which is fine. I just want I want you to be on the field <laughs> as much as possible. And I think he he is undersized, so that's not like a total total lock. But I think he probably is. Um, but you know, super productive, uh, three year guy coming out of Georgia, gonna get drafted in the top fifteen, top twenty anyway. Even if he were to fall a little bit. Could end up in a. I mean, it's one of those things where if he falls a little bit more, like does he end up on the Bengals or something where we can now get super excited? But there hasn't been the level of enthusiasm about Bowers that I expected. I thought it would be more kind of like when Pitts was coming in, where it was like, man, should we be taking Pitts or Jamar Chase? <laughs> if you were like, I'm thinking about taking Bowers over Marvin Harrison, people would like lock you away. <laughs> it's just yeah. not the conversation we're having. I wonder is it because of said, the pictures? <laughs> he looks like such a normal dude, and Pitts <laughs> looked like such a freak. Like, I, mean. I think I, honestly, that's probably a part of it. I also think the market has been burned by elite tight ends so much more since then, right? Like yeah. Kyle Pitts yeah. was supposed to be like this transcendent talent. You know, at the time he was kind of like breaking the mold. It wasn't really since like Gronk, we had seen someone really come out and just dominate. And it's like, these guys feel like unicorns. And then we all touched the stove, got burnt. And then we're like, yeah, we're just going to chill out (laughs) because I could draft Sam Laporte in the 14th round and he's going to have 10 TDs as a rookie. You know, like I do wonder, because like, let's be honest, if, if Brock Bowers did what Sam Laporte did as a rookie, I mean, you were doing fucking cartwheels. Oh yeah. 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 And he probably Laporte. won't, right? Like that's Laporte's had like the best tight end season ever for a rookie. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's is, unlikely. I think Bowers is still going higher than Pitts was in redraft. That's, I don't his think so. Seventy six. Where was Pitts at? I remember on the chase was a four. fifth round pick. By four. That's the difference. Is Mark maybe I'm remembering Harrison's, FFPC. Harrison's no, no. going way higher than Chase was as a rookie. That's a little. Oh like yeah, that. well we should get to that. But, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say the team Bime Four and I had uh, that everyone's sick of hearing about at this point in BBM two. We took Love Chase it. in Pitts at the four or five turn. Okay. When they oh, he took them both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's what I remember that he was he steamed up right of his yeah. ADP, but I think he was like mid to maybe Fifth round. like six at most. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So not and so B- Bowers is going later than that. He's going in yes. the early seventh. Pick 76, yeah. 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 By the way, when Pat earlier, when you made that comment on Drake London, you're like 37 overall. And I was like, what? 37? I, I couldn't believe that. I have not done any drafting yet, obviously, being you know in Washington. I counted out the wide receivers. He's wide receiver 26, but he's going 37 overall. <laughs> so I see that nothing has changed. <laughs> Welcome like, to early we're drafting. Right, we're right where <laughs> we need to be. 26 receivers in the first 37 Dude, picks. Got it. You can get like B. John Robinson at pick 11, and you're like, oh, fuck. I'm already way behind at wide receiver. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. I mean, I don't even. GA saying, talking about BBM2 in 2024. I mean, it is crazy. I mean, remember the pushback on Jamar Chase's ADP that year to the point yeah, where people were yeah. looking for excuses, the stripes on the ball that he couldn't catch to push him down. People were terrified. Oh my God, the stripes on the and, ball. And now people don't fucking blink selecting Malik neighbors in the mid third. Like you won't even blink. You won't hem and haw. You won't say, yeah. am I sure about this? Nope, just click and move on. Which by so, the way, I think Marvin Harrison's going too high. I'll just say it right now. Like I haven't <laughs> dug in to prospect stuff that much. He's going ahead of Brandon Ayuk. He's going ahead of Debo Samuel. He's going – Chris Olave. I just wrote up. I just said the NFC South. Second straight 25-plus yeah, targets per out run. I mean, like, the, that's a good football player. Like, I, I, I'm i not saying that Marvin Harrison isn't, but 18 overall is rich for a rookie. We know, like, Pat, from your research, they don't run a ton of routes typically. Like, he will, from day one, run a lot of routes, but you have to rely on efficiency. We don't even know where he's landing. It's probably Arizona. You look at uh, Chase and Jefferson. I just wrote up Arizona as well. I'm very in on Trey McBride still. Um, he McBride, I, uh, part of the reason I really like McBride is Harrison, as a rookie, I, I sorry, I, I went back to Chase and Jefferson. Both of those guys in their rookie years were in, tremendous, right? They both added more than two targets per game. They went from like seven-ish to like nine-plus-ish in year two because that's what happens like even the very best rookies can't dominate targets to such a degree that's i'm using as a positive in my trey mcbride thoughts early this offseason and i think 
probably all offseason I will, where I think Harrison is a great addition for McBride. He's going to draw attention away, but also not be so target dominant, right, from day one that McBride can't also thrive. That makes sense. But, I mean, pick 18. I mean, you're really, so, really sucking a lot of the juice out of the lemon there. I think it's fine. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, 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 mean I, I agree. <laughs> I, I think I also agree it's fine, and I also agree with Gretch. Like, I mean, there's – there's not a ton. He, it's very, very hard for him to smash that ADP. Is guess right. yeah, no, it is. Yeah, it is. He can very be what I just described, DJ Moore and, and Amari Cooper, where he can be very good all year and then have the spike week. Like that can happen. But it, it, you can think about. I mean, Garrett Wilson, right? Who famously went in the twelfth round. Remember those good old days? Um, really flashed. Had some yeah. good moments. Bad quarterback play. One two turn pick the next year. So like even right. Marvin Harrison. Like what does he have to even do to just be a one two turn pick? He just has to exist. He has to continue to breathe. That's that's how I've been thinking about it. As I mean, because you have to like this has never happened before, and so it's like how do I get my head around this? And I just been thinking like the market is treating him like he just had a very promising rookie season. And now we're like ready for him to to break out, and that is obviously, you know, kind of like literally jumping the gun by a full year. Um, but he is such like a bulletproof wide receiver prospect that I think it's I think I get it. And then from the perspective of I need this production, you know, I'm getting the production back weighted to the end of the season. It's like I he's he's probably worth the 18th pick. Like that that feels fair. I'm. His ADP is up to 17.9. Yeah. So you're, you're, behind ADP. I just want to get a value on him. <laughs> like, you're right. It's not happening. No, <laughs> I'm not getting still, any value. God damn. But I mean, efficient. again, it's, it's annoying your, when things are efficient. The the one that, yeah, it, it probably is efficient. The one counter, though, I'll say again is to your point that we're, the market's treating him like a year two player is year two players do get more volume. They do. Like, rookies right, do right. have rookie year problem. Like, the Chase and Jefferson point. Go look at their targets per game. I don't have the numbers. But those right guys, now, but they shot up and they crushed his rookies. They, but then they crushed their, they crushed a the second round ADP too. So I don't think he can crush this second they round did. ADP because he's not a second year guy. But they're kind of the market's like basically saying the assurance of like I know what I have here. I know who he is. I'm I'm not like I'm basically like taking away like big. But even guys. I guess my point is even if he's that great and I, I'm willing to buy that. We probably should expect it to manifest in a in an even more extreme way in year two than in year Agreed. one, and in year right. three than in year one. We'll draft him number two overall, then. So then he's number fucking two overall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, draft him <laughs> number two behind Jefferson or whatever. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to what, happen. You know what's kind of interesting <laughs> to me is like you know I don't know how much of it was because he didn't you know do anything at the combine or whatever, but in not taking these as gospel necessarily, but you've noticed the trend with these mock drafts coming out that there's some more gal braining going on with the non Harrison wide receivers. Like, Oh, this team's going to take neighbors uh, over Harrison. And we're going to put a dunes at like six or like ahead of these guys. But the underdog market has not budged on their unwavering Harrison support where it's almost like the mock draft industrial complex is starting to be like, I don't know, this guy could go ahead of him or he's closer to these guys than he thinks. And the underdog market's like no fucking way. Marvin Harrison at 18. Like, we are not coming off that. Well, credit What's the, credit to Underdog on that because – the Underdog drafters, I mean, because we shouldn't care. Marvin right. Harrison is viewed as a locked-in – a lot of play, a lot of people have him as the best player in the entire draft. The neighbors stuff is coming from people who love neighbors and think his skill set might be a better fit for their specific team. If Marvin Harrison goes three, four, five, or six – who fucking cares? And he will go. Wait, I mean, he's not even going to get to six. Like, he'll go by four for sure. So it's just like one of those things where the NFL has to split hairs because they have to put these guys on their specific teams. But we know this guy's going to have extremely high draft capital, and his prospect profile is pristine. He's, and he's clearly Marvin Harrison's son. So, like, we're we're in, you know? And I think I think the market should not get pushed around at all. Even if neighbors were to go ahead of him, we should be comfortable taking Harrison as the wide receiver one. The underdog drafters, when they've been in these situations, in, and there's been these types of spots that Pete, you just described, where they're like, fuck it, no, we're not going to mess around with this. We're going to keep taking Marvin Harrison 18. They've been right basically every time. And as you were talking about that, 
I was thinking back to something I did talk about with Bime for yesterday on that pod that we were just discussing. And he was talking about the evolution of zero RB over the last 10 years. And I was like, yeah, but like the first seven of those years or whatever, eight of those years, we were trying to tell people the logic is sound and, and you need to pay attention to it. And nobody cared. And it, I mean, I, there was, you had like the running back zealot, uh, the zero RB zealots who totally bought into the logic and the the theory behind it. But there were so many people that said this hasn't won anything and this, not and the other thing. And one of the things that I think is so interesting in now, relation now to stop winning things. Right. <laughs> now it won't stop. And 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 Brian Farr and I were talking about how it's really just the last like three or four years where zero RB has evolved massively because now it's being more widespread adopted. Right. But really the reason for that that just crystallizes Pete was talking about the way underdog drafters are uh, on Marvin Harrison is underdog. And you just said credit to underdog drafters like the underdog drafters, the people that are willing to do these best ball drafts, the the sickos and and the ways that ADP gets pushed how wide receiver heavy it's gotten pushed at times, how extreme. It's been like a Petri dish for the things that we talked about for like 10 fucking years. What is it? What is the equilibrium point? Well, way more wide receivers should be going in the first four rounds. We were talking about that in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, like for a long ass time. Like there should be a lot more wide receivers going way earlier. It finally started happening in underdog. And then that's trickled to every other form of fantasy. It has impacted everything. It started... Remember last year when you had the FFPC grinders being like, yeah, we're still taking running backs early, but it, they were showing their draft boards like they had never changed their strategy, but they were all doing anchor running back and not hitting anything in the in the, in the the dead zone. And it was like, yeah, you guys used to take like five straight running backs. We all know it. But now you're doing all these receivers in the dead zone and acting like you never shifted because you're still taking a running back in round one, which is fine, whatever. But like there was a clear shift is the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. And I think a, almost all of that has come from best ball – where people are willing to try more extreme things and all of these types of things, like a fucking rookie going 17.9 in March when he's not even on an NFL team yet, it's proven and to he might be on the, the Patriots. needle. That's that's where it goes wrong for Harrison is if he gets yeah. on the Patriots. Yeah. That's what I that's why it's too frothy for me. I'm like, we don't even know what fucking yeah. team he's on. Because that, that is like a legitimate downside outcome. Because I mean, he could end up on the Patriots with like Jacoby Brissett or some like total bridge situation, and it's like it's just, it's just not how worth it. How far do you think he it. falls in the market? Not how, even how much he should. I, I don't think he still goes past mid third, even on the Patriots. I think he goes. Yeah. I think he goes early third, third round. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. He's not getting to the fourth. Right, he, no. he he won't. He will go ahead of Jalen Waddle. Yeah. <laughs> Can I? Which is crazy. Can't. That guy was going he, like early second last year, he's like, and he's and still he's good. good. He's very good. Yeah, and it, it, I guess it isn't even like – it's not insane when you think like the market was already willing to take these secondary wide receivers, the T. Higgins, the Devontae Smith, and the Jalen Waddle, all very good prospects in their own right. But like the market is good at understanding these are good players who earn targets, and I'm not going to really sweat the small stuff, like them playing alongside an alpha target earner. Although Waddle is too cheap, so I think the market's sweating the small stuff a little more this year than it did last year. With both, I mean, with both those guys, because I think people feel a little burned by Jalen Waddle, Devontae Smith, and T. Higgins from last year. Although I kind of feel like we just kind of ran bad with Waddle. We almost ran really good with Higgins. Um, so I'm generally back in now. The prices are all lower. So, all right, let me ask you about another rookie. I I feel like I'm taking like crazy pills, even when I look at your rankings. I just saw Mike Clay post his top 10 ranks it obviously it includes quarterbacks and tight ends but xavier worthy is nowhere to be found not even on the top 10 keon coleman ahead of him this isn't a shot at mike clay pat i i'm even surprised at your ranking of him like i would bet so much yeah. money this guy oh, yeah. is the top 100 top 90 top 80 pick by the time best ball mania closes. i know i keep falling like, behind adp he's shooting up He's I'm like, what, what more do we need to know about Xavier Worthy? And anyone who's like really plugged into draft stuff, like Travis May thinks he's going to go like top 20 in the NFL draft. It's like, what are we doing? Like, I feel like we're ignoring. I would like to hear a little thing. bit from his nutritionist about what the plan is now. <laughs> That's what I would but like I, to are, know. are we now in this era where we don't have to worry about that that much? I do still worry about 165. I, I do still worry about that. I'm going to raise him up. But he is – the weight to me is like – it's, I mean, I think it mattered for Devontae Smith. I think like Devontae Smith is a very talented wide receiver who 
there's like a reason it's like what he was the 10th overall pick he's not an elite wide receiver i think the fact that he's like very very skinny hurts um obviously tank dell just had an amazing season um and then got hurt and then he just, got hurt I mean, true kind of kind of fluke run blocking but got rolled up on the issue is these guys bodies are not strong enough to handle huge i, I think 2023 was a, a season where we learned the opposite lesson that the weight still matters that these hyper small guys aren't going to be able to take a million hits and and uh, like they're going to be really efficient but they're they're probably going to get hurt at a higher rate keaton mitchell was sweet until he got hurt two different times a chan got hurt like right after i mean look he's awesome i still want to be in on a chan but like what's that i'm still very in on a chan <laughs> yeah yeah i still want to <laughs> yeah. be in on him uh tank dell got hurt Tutu Atwell was so small that they ended up just benching him and being like, look, he can't run block enough. Like, we got to play Demarcus Robinson over him. Yeah. I think the the weight stuff, I wrote about it in my, like, biggest lessons learned from 2023 thing where I think that's going to go under the radar. It's been moving towards lighter for a lot of years. I think we hit the extreme, and teams are going to be like, wait, like, they're still playing a gladiator sport, and they still have to be – decently sized like they can't just be nothing although you know xavier worthy is the fastest guy that ever ran in football pads so like i mean that's a, if he can run past everybody like it doesn't matter they can't hit him yeah in my yeah, i guess I honestly he's my, really right on this i need to move my, on. In, my, in my take is more just again like the the clv type stuff i mean every single uh wide receiver who went in round one last year closed as a top 84 pick on underdog uh, you know, and it's like these guys, I mean, uh, you, you're going to have Xavier Worthy go in the same range that uh, JSN, Quentin Johnston, and Xavier. That's Arden. the part I'm skeptical of. I, what I'm seeing is like he seems more likely to go. We were actually just today, Daniel Raz, who's usually got a really good feel for this stuff. He was saying, let's see, he was thinking he thought Worthy had a 55 to 65 percent chance of going in the first round. Um he thinks A.D. Mitchell is much more likely to go in the first round. So I think I think he's probably more like, if he does go in the first round, it's probably 25 to 32. He's not going to fall out of like the top 40. He's going to go early in the second if he doesn't go in the late first. But but I don't think he goes in the in the you know early 20s or whatever. Man, I, I would love to get some odds on that. Uh, not saying with you necessarily. I'm just like very bullish on the NFL being very – excited about him and then you go and look at what he did as a freshman early breakout mm -hmm. double digit mm -hmm. touchdowns 39 percent dominator rating like again i'm not even saying he's going to hit i am just going to say like nfl team are they are going to look and they're saying this isn't just marquise goodwin this is a guy who was productive at a big school and literally is the fact fastest fucking guy to come into the league like i mean He's going. To I think. I think this is a great take, Pete. Yeah. By the way, no, like I just made the whole thing about take. small people, but I think it's a great take <laughs> about small um, people. <laughs> and so, if that's if that's the case, if he even goes, if he even sniffs where those guys went, twenty five. I mean, you're right. And then the thing is, is like, okay, say he doesn't go early twenties. Well, then he is going to a team that's really good. He's going to the Bills. He's going to the Ravens. He's going to the Chiefs. And then, like, he's going to be a top eighty pick anyways. So. Um, Pat, uh, I gotta get you get your stuff now. Yeah, no, no I'm, I, I think you're right. I think we just. I think that's a that's a great take. The other the rookie that I want to ask Pat is I gotta get my update on where you're at on Roma Dunze. I'm just chugging along with the market on Rome. I I think he's he's a good pick in these best ball drafts. Let's see, we have him at 44. Uh, his ADP is 48, so we're slightly ahead. It's in a range of the draft where. I typically need a wide receiver. I take tight end or quarterback there too. If I, you know, God, the tight end poses right now are nice. Um, but Rome, I take a fair amount. I'm just he he kind of checks a lot of boxes for an older guy that I felt that way before the combine. And then he tested really well. So incredibly well. Yeah. I wanted your take, Gretch, more as like the <laughs> the you know in on a Dunze before the combine. Like when you saw some of the stuff, more of the um like puff piece stuff about him being the last guy to yeah. leave the field wanting. I mean, does that just check out with his MO his entire time at UW? I, I mean, the thing about him at UW, like they had him kick return early. We knew that kind of stuff or we don't stuff in prospects uh, matters. They on a, a massive fourth and one in their own territory 
in a near upset late in the year against rival Washington State, they went for it to try to clinch the game. They called an end around to Roma Dunze. Like, why would you call that on a fourth and one? You do it because it's Roma Dunze. Every key third down, every key fourth down, you knew Roma Dunze was going to get open and was going to make the play. Like, when you watch this team last year, I, I – I'm also really interested in, in what you're learning from an analytical perspective on, on Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk. I ended up really liking Polk a lot more than McMillan. I talked about this some um, back when we, you know, brought down the Huskies when we were talking about like the Oregon game and stuff in the fall. Yeah. But people maybe didn't know those names as well back then. But I think McMillan gets a little more hype from what I've seen. I always liked Polk a little more watching. Um, McMillan's not a guy I felt super reliable with, but my point is all three of them are pretty good. They all tested, I think nine plus RAS, like, which surprised me. I didn't even know all three would be combine invites, even having watched the team. But you, the point I'm trying to drive home is even with three really good ones and they had two good tight ends, Devin Culp went and ran a four, four, seven. He's the, one of the Huskies tight ends. The other one, Jack Westover, probably not a prospect, but he was like a six year tight end that was like people liked him, but you know, they liked him on the team and, and he played a lot. They had a lot of targets, a lot of places the ball could go. And yet Roma Dunze was so clearly the alpha in every single like key moment in every single way that you'd want your alpha to be an alpha and always came up clutch. And I talked about this before, but like was really good downfield. Like whenever they threw downfield to him, he'd make sick plays, but also they'd throw wide receiver screens to him. He was great. At yak, like always getting, you know, uh, extra yards. I mean, he's not like Debo, but like he does have physicality on like little bubble screens and stuff. He would always get like eight yards where like McMillan doesn't. That dude can't break a tackle. It killed us in the national championship. He had two chances to break a tackle and run for a lot of yards and he just got tackled by like an arm. Anyway, um, my my take on the Dunze is like I, I love the guy. I loved watching him. I when I saw that the stuff in the uh, on the combine, like his numbers, it did surprise me a little bit. But at the same time, like it was more just like, well, that's why, like, that's how he was able to be as good as he was. Like, it, he uses that athleticism to put up his numbers. Like, we talk about how the combine doesn't matter as much as production because the guys have to be able to use their athleticism to put up numbers. So, Dunze did that, right? Like, that's, it was like, okay, this makes sense. Like, he was a really good route runner. That's why his shuttle drills were good. But he was also like a good jumper and contested catch guy whenever I watched him. It makes sense that he jumped well. And I, I mean, I was surprised at his 40 time, but not like shocked. Like, he's, I, I'm I'm really excited to watch it in the NFL. I got excited about John Ross, and that didn't pan out. So I'm like I'm a little <laughs> bit concerned. He seems yeah. so much more of a like a professional wide receiver, though. Way more yeah. refined. Yeah, he does. He he seems a little like Michael Crabtree ish to me. Is That's that... a good call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's like I a like very that. like professional guy. Like I don't know that we're gonna be like, man. I you know this this guy's rivaling for like the one of the top fantasy wide receivers in the league necessarily, but. The thing that's nice about Adunze is like he's there's two wide receivers that are going super high this year, and he's not one of them. Now he's going a lot higher than we typically would be taking a rookie wide receiver, but he's like, I don't know, compared to the other two guys, I'm like, man, this is like feels feels like I, I just these guys have been priced like that this the whole way, and it just feels correct. Yeah, and if Crabtree is a good comp. Yeah, I, I, I've got it like Pittman, Drake London, that mold, like a, a, yeah. a legit like X receiver can win in the short and in the deeper range, add some, you know, thickness and physicality, yak ability. I mean, it's it's that type of receiver for sure. Is the biggest red flag for on his profile just that he wasn't an early declare? Yeah. I think Which the is. whole team came back. The, Washington's going to have – they have the second most combine invites. They – I believe I read that it set a Pac-12 record. Um, they um, – are going to have both of their tackles go in the first two days. Penix, the quarterback, uh, you know, all the receivers are going to go reasonably high. Not as many defenders. The point is, like, every like Penix could have went pro last year. A few of those guys. Adunze, when Adunze said he was coming back, it was like people were excited. He could have went pro last year is the point I'm trying to make. He came back because the whole team wanted to go try to make a run at this thing. And they obviously they made the national championship. But it was, uh, was kind of like a unified thing. And so anyway. That's just I, I don't knock him as much for that personally. Why were yeah, why we're on the oh go ahead, Pat. He had a really strong uh freshman, or I guess it would have been his sophomore season. Um 30% dominator rating, fell off a little bit to 25% in his second year, and his yards per outrun were good, not great, uh, as an underclassman. 
So that would be kind of like the underclassman profile. He gained substantial draft capital from returning, which would be yeah your red flag. You've said that before. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What uh, I was doing my show with the Badge Bros and a fellow Husky fan, John Warner, wanted to get your take on Dylan Johnson, a guy I've seen in, in Pat's rakes a few times when I'm at the end of the draft <laughs> looking for a, a dart throw running back. No, no love for Dylan Johnson? No. I mean, I, I, I love Dylan Johnson. He was super fun. Uh, we went down on the field uh, after the Oregon win at Husky Stadium. Like, I was up in the upper decks, but when we came down, me and a buddy were just like, well, they're still out on the field. We'll just go out there. Because that game was decided with a missed field goal at the end of the game, so the, the fans r- rushed the field, and Dylan Johnson was the last player out there. And there was this like super hammered frat bro, just like talking to him about like how he's the shit and all this stuff, and he was just sitting there like letting him go. Like he's like, just you just go for it, man. And I was like, that dude's cool, man. Like Dylan Johnson's yeah. awesome. Also, when we went to the um, semifinals, I think he had a huge contingent of family there. A lot of people in Dylan Johnson's jerseys. Uh, I had some pretty sweet seats and. Anyway, I just he seems like a great guy. Seems like, you know, a lot of people care about him, love him, all that stuff. To me, like early in the year, he wasn't great last year, and I wanted them to stop giving him the ball as much because we had such a dominant passing game and teams were sitting back in in like a lot of these coverages with extra DBs. And we had this freshman runner who was a little quicker named Tybo Rogers. I wanted them to use him more to eat up space, basically. I didn't need him to break tackles, but like some of these runs would be well blocked and there's no linebackers. And it's like, just get downfield, get six yards or whatever, because Dylan Johnson just didn't really hit holes that hard. Then against USC, whose defense was historically bad this year, he had an absolutely monster game. He had like 250 yards, four touchdowns, which was just like, it was more about USC's defense being a laughing stock. He can ask uh, Hayden about that. I remember he was tweeting during the game and he was like, this is, this is <laughs> like embarrassing. He's a big USC fan. Um, it did not surprise me that he ran a four, six, eight. I never thought he was like particularly explosive. He's a biz- bigger physical dude, but I don't think he's an NFL running back. I-, I don't think he's a guy that I think he'll go late. And I don't think he'll really ever have a meaningful role in the NFL. I mean, from what I saw in college. God, Jesus. <laughs> Gretch talking about Johnson, the way Jay has said, talking about Shane Walter. That's, that's oh, similar. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, also uh, shout out to the ship chasers. Appreciate you guys joining us live in the chat tonight. Ship chasers. Don't forget to do your duty and like the stream says Tyler. Every sailor does his part to keep the ship afloat. That's right. We are famously uh, ships sinking in the sea, which is a, an unfortunate <laughs> metaphor for this specific show. <laughs> it is, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gretch, what about Penix? What are your thoughts on, on his I don't- prospects? I don't, I don't know entirely. Uh, early in last year, so he was only here for two years. Early last year, I thought more of his success was about the offense and the scheme, and I thought we did a lot of really smart stuff with misdirection and stuff. And uh, so one of the things that I think he, people say he's a great deep ball thrower and all this stuff. He has a cannon, and he throws a really good spiral. He has huge hands, which that didn't surprise me that he tested with huge hands. We've joked about that for like over a year at UW where his spirals, in, even in the rain up here, like always there. So you knew we had big hand size. Like you knew that was something that, that he brought to the table, but people love to say because of how pretty of a ball he throws, how strong his arm is that he throws like a really great deep ball. And I remember early this past year, uh, the Boise state game in particular stands out to me where he had a couple open deep guys that he just like overthrew. And, and it was like, man, you can't miss opportunities like that when you have guys open I'm not saying that he's not a good deep ball thrower because he also threw a lot of really, really nice balls, some really pretty balls late in the uh, season and some key spots. But my thing is our offense was very vertical and attacked. And I think people look at the highlights and they see a lot of those really great throws. And my, my little point would be part of it is just that he got a lot of opportunities to throw deep is sort of, you know, and some of them didn't hit. Some of them weren't super accurate. A couple are just some sick ass catches by Polk and Adunze where like, if you go really watch some of the like the long completions for those guys on their highlight film, they're not great balls. There's like one where Polk goes up and is like all the way like this and gets rocked and holds onto it. And it's like that's a 60 yard completion, but didn't or 40 yard completion, but it didn't really deserve to be. It was a pretty poor throw, but Polk makes an incredible play on it. Um, but no, I mean, I think the, the thing I like about him the most, more than being a deep ball thrower, is how good of a spiral he throws in the intermediate ranges and to the sidelines and the arm strength. Like he was always really good at throwing like a 10 yard curl on time or an out pattern on time. 
Um, never had concern about like them throwing on a fourth down because he would be accurate on like a, you need to get a completion play. You know what I mean? So anyway, he's not super mobile either. He's a pocket passer, good arm, doesn't like pressure. That's another issue I had like against Arizona state. They got a ton of pressure up the middle on us. Double a gap blitzes all day. And our offense was horrible. We almost got upset in that game as well. And we had a really good O line. So one of the things is like, you know, both of our tackles are going to get drafted. If he goes to the NFL and he's not behind a great line, how does that manifest? He didn't do great with pressure in the national championship against Michigan. I thought that was one of his worst games as a Husky, unfortunately. Um, so anyway, throws a really good ball, good arm strength, but not like perfectly accurate. And I think does need to be in like a system that has a good offensive line and can kind of protect him and those kinds of things. Yeah, his, his accuracy under pressure is a big red flag in my stuff. Is it? Yeah. Stats? Yeah, yeah, the stats. His his big time throws <laughs> on deep throws were good, but not great. So like big time deep throws per drop back was was good, but it wasn't kind of to your point. It, and he had probably two. more deep attempts per drop. Yeah, back yeah, probably had more big time. Yeah, yeah. Um, Pat, do yeah, you have him good. firmly as the QB four, or is Nick's real close for you? Nick's comes out ahead in my stuff, but kind of in the same tier okay. um so it would be like if i mean if Penix were to be a first round pick then like i have them both plugged in as like early second round picks if if one of them were to be a first round pick then i would clearly prefer that guy but i have it as um the the first tier being williams and may the second tier being daniels the third tier being mccarthy and the fourth tier then being Kind of however it shakes out in the draft, really, but probably that probably Knicks um, and then Penix. Penix is the kind of QB that could be fun for fantasy. I don't know that like so, sorry, not he him. Doesn't run that much. Sorry, he could be oh, fun. He I said yes. that weird. Yes. yes, he throws a good ball and he and he gets the ball out because he doesn't like taking a lot of hits. If he was in a good system at some point in his career. Like a Kirk Cousins, you know, we're like, yeah, there's just a lot of pass attempts and there's catchable balls out there and you get a lot of receptions and it's just like, all right, I'll take that. You know, even though Cousins like takes check downs too often and stuff like that. You know, it comes up as his closest statistical comp for me is Derek Carr. That's the other guy I was thinking of when I said Cousins. <laughs> yeah. that's, I mean, that makes sense. That's exactly like that's what, what Penix is, honestly. A lefty Derek Carr. Lefty Derek Carr, I mean. It could be, yeah. I, it could be good. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of, I hope he gets drafted in the early second round, um, and then he'll be a pretty fun super flex pick. He'll be kind of levity where people will be like, oh, he, there's no point, and then he'll end up. Being what if he ended game. up like on, on the Broncos? Like, I mean, what, yeah. what, what kind of spot? I mean, you get. There's some talk that the Seahawks are going to get him. So the Seahawks hired. Ryan Grubb was the offensive coordinator here with Kalen DeBoer last year at UW. DeBoer got the Alabama job. Grubb was going to go with him and took the Alabama OC job. And then the Seahawks hired him away from Alabama where he was like technically the OC for, I don't know, a month. And then the Seahawks hired him. So there's some speculation that the Seahawks might be in on Penix to pair with his college OC. Same, it's very like it's the light version of how people are saying the commanders are going to try to get Caleb Williams because they went and got Cliff Kingsbury. And also because they are. <laughs> I, I believe it. I think they're going to put do? it back together. Yeah. I, think I mean, you almost have a duty to try to get up. I, why would the Bears do that? I If I'm the Bears, I just take Caleb Williams. Why would I? You might get a first out of that. I, I would do it if I were there. If you're giving me a first to go down, but I like Drake May a lot, but I would, I would do it. If Caleb Williams is like, what if he's CJ Stroud and then you have to get Bryce Young? Yeah, that sure. I mean, is it what if. Sleep at night? <laughs> I mean, what if Williams is the Bryce Young? You know, he was Bryce yeah. Young won first last year. But you lose your job if you trade back a spot, and and then even if like no one cares, yeah. you got an extra first, right? Like if if it is that's true, you're gonna get. There's no scenario where you're gonna get blamed for taking Caleb Williams, even if he's yeah. terrible. You know, you're. It's like, well, what what was I supposed to do? Yeah. But if you trade if you trade off Caleb Williams and it doesn't go well, you will get fired. You have him. to be right. It Drake Bay has kind of to like be as rough. good as yeah yeah. <laughs> Reputationally, it's an unnecessary risk for sure. It's a big anyway. Time I would risk. Do it. 
<laughs> totally do it. Spoken like a true two millionaire. This guy. <laughs> your uh, your risk assessment has changed a lot over the last year, buddy. <laughs> fuck it. I'll, I'll, I'll ah, fuck it. I got I got two million in the bank. What the fuck? <laughs> Did you guys see that quote? Uh, or is a video? I don't know if it was McDermott or if it was Bean. It was one of the Bills guys, and they were someone asked them about like, you know what they gave up to get Josh Allen and the confidence. And he, he just had like the honest, the most honest answer ever. And if he was like, if Josh Allen's great, no one's going to give a fuck what we gave up to get him. Like no one. Yeah. And if he's not good, I'm not going to be here. I'm so, going to get fired. Yeah. Like, yeah. So like, who gives a shit? And it's like, man, that is so true. Like that is what a GM's mindset is. Right. Yeah. And we should yeah. always keep that in mind. But like it, it also it sucks. If I'm a fan, I'm like that kind of sucks because you I know. don't be as committed to this team as I do. I'm more committed. No, they're, as yeah, a fan. for sure. The like, incentives you, are not aligned for no. like the long term. I mean, across the board, you know, even a GM to a coach, like those incentives aren't often aligned. Like the the time horizons are different. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy when you see these franchises that don't reset when they bring the new coach in it's like you have to do you have to do the move where you you bring the gm and the coach like immediately the gm and the coach not on the same page like great great job like why why would you do the other i mean the bears thing like you don't give ever eberflus that that year you just don't like and it might work out fine but that's you have if you're gonna draft a quarterback number one overall, like bring in an offensive head coach and 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 give him that shot to to pair with the quarterback and have this be a decade long partnership or whatever. You know, you got a, you got like an okay defensive mind. Bad job, Bears. Yeah. You guys have any thoughts on free agent landing spots you'd like to see? We have all these running backs i feel like are kind of the the headliners are they even gonna sign right away or are they all just gonna linger until like july because like it feels like the last couple years some of these vets have had to wait until after the draft and then they still don't sign and then it's like i mean they should are we gonna have that bottle wait till november then never even get called up (laughs) right but like there's so many of them don't you feel like a couple that might happen to them i mean it's gonna be interesting to see what happens Last year, the 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 Lions signed Montgomery, and somebody signed someone else to like decent deals, and then it really quickly was like, "Wow, you shouldn't have paid any running back any money in free agency because no one else is even getting signed to cheap deals." And like yeah. they just all sat on the market, and the, the the deals that everyone had to accept, like Rashad Penny had to accept this tiny deal, Damian Harris like had to accept this tiny deal. Uh, Jamal Williams is coming off twenty touchdowns. Said he, I think he got decent money from the Saints, actually. Which and your your why, point is they're sitting why? there looking at the deal Dalvin Cook got and being like, why don't I just wait till the sense of urgency really ratchets up for one of these teams? As yeah, to when the mean, market's flooded and pre-draft where all these teams are like, yeah, I'll just get whoever in the draft. Well, even uh, apart from the Dalvin Cook thing, uh, my other point is like there was. I feel like there's there's 32 teams. There was like three teams that were willing to pay a running back last year. And I think that number has gotten smaller every year. And it might eventually get to like one or zero, right? Like where nobody's really willing to give a lot of guaranteed money when there's this many options that are available. Yeah. And you can just draft running backs as well. I mean, it's it's been a long-term decline in the, in the running back position, obviously. But did you guys see? I don't the, know. Uh... It'll be interesting. See the Derrick Henry uh, little uh, Twitter post today? No, what do you say? Uh, well, it wasn't him. Derrick Henry just bought a new house in Dallas. I know he and his family are from Texas, but buying a new house here when he's a free agent has me thinking some things. And wow. I feel like that one would actually make a little bit of sense. Jerry be a like Jerry would fucking love Derrick Henry uh, on the couch. Oh yeah, you know that's perfect. He would love it. Yeah. Yeah, Henry's the one. Like in general, I would say this group of running backs feels like we're going to be happy we we pass on them more than than not. But there almost has to be some big winners in the group. Yeah. Um, and Henry is the one who I feel probably best about because uh, because Henry's just like such a mountain of a man that like even if he's on limited work, like it's gonna be 
tilted to touchdowns. You know, like they're going to be bringing him. They will bring Derrick Henry in around the goal line. He he should. I guess for some reason I think of him as more likely to go to one of these better teams just because he's like on the lower, you know, the end of his career. He brings an element so clearly to an offense that the Ravens, the Cowboys would would I think pretty would be happy to add. So he's he's the one I've mixed in the most. I and you know, I, I've once I got sniped on a Lamar stack and I just took Henry. So there you go. <laughs> I didn't really realize this, but he – I noticed this today in some research. He led the NFL in rush attempts last year. I mean, he still had a 300-touch season last year. It was a lot less efficient. Right. Scored 12 touchdowns, though, 280 rush attempts. I mean, that's one thing he can point to is, like, I'm still carrying a lot of volume, even if my efficiency has fallen off and I'm not ripping off 90-yard touchdown runs all the time like he did in his prime. Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with you. It's going to be a crazy game of chicken – for these guys because you know there's only so much money out there and then there's only a couple like destinations that are going to be like super attractive that would also be willing to pony up maybe like a baltimore type situation even though baltimore doesn't strike me as a team who's gonna unload um right for a bad i just i just sorted by rush attempts henry was first but mixon was fifth pollard was seventh barkley was eighth and josh jacobs was 11th wow all those yep. guys are free agents. Uh, five yep. of the top eleven in rush attempts last year. I mean, whew. yeah. S- what Swift? The other one. Um, Swift is twelfth. Is he a free agent? Swift yep. is a free agent, and he's getting drafted wow. like he is not, but he very much is, and also not that great. <laughs> I don't know. Six I don't know why people top, drafted him. Six of the top twelve running backs in rush attempts last year are are currently free agents. That's crazy. Yep. Yeah. Well, you know, noted uh, Miles Sanders was the other good deal last year. That's right. It was Sanders and Montgomery right away the first couple days Mm -hmm. of free agency. And then it was like no other good deals (laughs) like for running backs. And Miles Sanders got his deal because he crushed behind the Philly O-line that DeAndre Smith couldn't crush (laughs) in backup. Yeah. But then he also went and he sucked in, in Carolina. And it's another one of those like, words of caution right like carolina paid a big deal yeah. to a running back and he wasn't very good i mean it's just it's unfortunate for sure i mean these are human beings but i in, in terms yeah. of trying to predict what happens i think there's a very clear trend that nfl teams are less likely to to give a ton of money to these running backs it'll be interesting i think some of these dudes are going to linger in free agency through march into april into may it's going to be it makes sense it's, like it's kind of um man, I don't know what a good analogy for it is too, but like the relationship between these players and their agents and what they're telling them. Like if you tell your agent, like I have this firm number, like I'm not playing for anything less than that. And they're like, shit. Or if it's like, Hey, go get me one of these two open jobs, one to two, where they're actually interested. And let's just like beat everyone to the punch. Let's fucking sign on the dot and make sure that I'm not on the couch until early September kind of thing. Right. Because then their pride, like I get it. Right. None of them want to swallow their pride and like take a way below market deal. Like that, that kills these guys who are like household fantasy names, big names in the NFL to be like, holy shit. But, make yeah. But even the guys that have done that, like, so one was uh, Melvin Gordon tried to hide out with the Chargers and or hold out and then eventually came back. And then the, and he, he didn't take the deal they put out there because it wasn't enough for what he wanted relative to the previous deals that had been signed. But that, that, ball had already started rolling and he eventually came back played out his deal and then signed a way weaker deal with the broncos and basically just didn't make much more money the rest of his career if you go back and look at that and and look at the the contract that the chargers offered him that he held out and refused to sign he very much should have taken the deal that the chargers offered him the guaranteed money in that deal. deal for the chargers i mean they had eckler already right so they ended up just paying Eckler a smaller deal the next year than Eckler wanted to raise and now I think they're you know they're letting Eckler walk it's I mean even the guys that you know have had that pride and I mean it's just it's never worked out well for the running backs over the last five to ten years I I Peter if I was in that spot what you just described I would definitely be the one telling my agent I mean obviously I'm not I don't know at all what it's like but I would be the one based on the trends, what I'm seeing, like get me whatever you can get me early when there's money to be spent. I don't want to be sitting there waiting and hoping I get the Dalvin Cook thing 
because the yeah. Falcons and Cook got bailed out, and I think it had a lot to do with Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, it definitely had a lot yeah. to do with Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I I would uh, I would also be trying to do that. I mean, you're. I mean, the other move is to try to just go to a good team, you know. But there's not. Well, yeah. how about this? Are there any of these uh, free agent running backs that we're discussing right now? And, you know, they're all kind of going in a very similar range. You know, Jacobs, 59.6, Henry, 61, uh, you know, Pollard, 79, Eckler, 82. Are there any of these guys that you think could actually jump significantly because of a free agent landing spot? That's a good question. I think any of them could, you know, because there are some good landing spots. Um one of them being the Bengals, you know, if they get rid of Mixon, they were bringing someone else more cheaply or whatever. Uh, the Vikings, you know, Cowboys, um, Cowboys, even the Panthers would have some appeal if it was like kind of a clear bell cow type of guy where I, you know, that, that one's less appealing, but I think you could still see someone jump. The um, Packers is a weird one, but there was that report that Dylan is probably going to get, let go, but like move on, yeah. and they're going to yeah. retain Aaron Jones. But like, he's Aaron contract, Jones, is, yeah. he's going to be like their slash secondary guy. Like, if somebody was in the AJ Dillon role, but efficient, more efficient than AJ Dillon, like that could be valuable. I think, uh, if I can concoct what would move the most, I think Eckler to the Bengals would probably be the biggest potential rise in ADP you could see. Because people yeah. are already excited about whoever's the back there, like by default. Sure. The problem is that I don't know that he really, like, I, I don't know that I would feel that great about taking him where he's even been going, even if he did land with the Bengals. Cause like he's, he's kind of, he's looking pretty done. You know, it's really about his pass catching yeah. ability, which he definitely has, but He's probably in a timeshare with with Chase Brown, I I would guess, and it's going to be front loaded production. So I don't know. I mean, I guess it's like one of those things. I'm having I'm having trouble taking Eckler now because it's like, man, even in the dream scenario, like how much higher would I actually feel comfortable taking him? And probably be like early sixth is where I'd feel like okay about. It. And that's that's like a round and a half. So that's, yeah. that's a I think play. he'd be, I think he'd jump hey, to a fifth, fifth round pick on the, on the Bengals. I, I'm, I do too. I'm at, saying I wouldn't want to take him. I, I'm but, just yeah. l- looking at your Twitter bio that says, uh, <laughs> Austin Eckler is a legend. I'm, I wonder if somebody sent that clip to, to him. Who's he's very yeah. aware of the fantasy well, football listen, space. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, that, you know, <laughs> that time exists and, uh, and it ravages our bodies, but here I, we are. I, I'm compromised too. Uh, Austin Eckler started following me on Twitter uh, the other oh, wow. day as well. Uh, he's got some. Uh, he's Listen, an investor over at Fantasy. If, Life, if, so now I, I got to watch my tongue when talking. I would love <laughs> to pound the table for Austin Eckler, and I would love to have eighty uh, percent of Austin Eckler. Just don't draft him until the double digit rounds. Look, and then I will. look, I need Austin Eckler to follow me now, so I'll just point out that Joe Burrow's been really good at. His running backs have been really good at, on like the receiving side. Like he's one of the low key premier. I've kind of compared him to like Drew Brees in this regard. Premier quarterbacks for running back receiving. They've had some really high catch rates, and I do think there's something to that. The quarterbacks that get through their reads quick enough, get down to their check down, deliver the ball to them before the linebackers are like collapsing on the check down, get it there on time and with a little bit of touch, and it's catchable. Every back he's played with has been pretty good in that regard. It was a little worse last year, but the first three years, it's a larger sample that it's um, really it's probably oh. has something to do with the plays. You know, like it's like how quickly are you supposed to get to the back underneath, and is the back always there, or is he in blocking and that type of thing too? So, actually, last year they were good too. Component. Yeah, Chase Brown, fourteen of fifteen targets, ninety-three percent catch rate, which is absurd. Joe Mixon, fifty-two of sixty-four, much higher volume, eighty-one percent, also really high for a running back. So last year was still really strong. If Eckler was there, I would be excited about his reception upside in PPR. Maybe not Me so too. much in PPR. Me too. Yeah, but but where would you want to take him on underdog? Yeah, it's a little bit different on underdog. I I, I agree with your points about being front-loaded, and I mean, yeah, there would be some risk. 
It'd be tricky. What about what about Barkley? Like, because his ADP is still frothy. I mean, he's a back it's end around two. Very point. frothy. Yeah. I haven't yeah. even thought about taking Barkley once. And are people just hanging their hat on the pass catching there too? I mean, I guess the massive volume he's, he got, but he hasn't been efficient as a pass catcher in years. In like yeah. literal, like since his rookie year, he hasn't been he hasn't been uh, impressive as you know in yards per out run. I think since his rookie year, um, I don't know Barkley. He looked a little bit better than the year before in some of the advanced rushing stuff. Um, and so I think he's fine, but he, he is. He's going 22.9 in a, yeah. you know, a year where like running backs yeah. aren't even going in the first three rounds. That's wild. His profile's very similar to like a Josh Jacobs at this point, where his, his superpower for fantasy is going to be to take all the snaps and put them all together. You know, and and consolidate that workload into one person. But now he's going to be doing that. I don't know where. You know, and there's there's landing spots where like, you know, people are like, "What if he goes to the Texans?" Like, yeah, that's pretty sweet. But also, I don't think they just give him like you know all the snaps. You know, I, I don't know if he has eighty percent of the snaps in Houston. They they tend to be a team that rotates it out more. Maybe he's their McCaffrey, and then you know I'm going to look very silly, but. Yeah, he's not been tricky. nearly as efficient as McCaffrey as yeah. a rusher or or a receiver. So I just think people are not but the stuff the downside here. That's fair. The the stuff that went into him going second overall and how incredibly he tested, it's a lot of years removed, but that stuff does stick with players, man. Like NFL teams basically their whole careers continue to care about draft capital and the way that they make decisions. I think he actually is low key. I think the 22.9 ADP is too high, but he is low key one that he went to the Texans or something, people would be like, all right, we'll just give him all the work. Like I actually, he would, he would go up in ADP for oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, he goes yeah, to the Texans. Yeah. He would be a one, two turn pick. Barkley is a guy. <laughs> so like when I think through this stuff, you know, now, and it's crazy that it's March 7th and I'm already like thinking about my end of draft season portfolio and what it might look like. But like Barkley is someone I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have a fade stance on, but I'm more comfortable mixing him in at a higher price with known information than I am just like taking him now and hoping it works out. Like there's, he, he's flashing like the type of back who you don't really want to take until probably like the sixth round. Like that, that's where I think we're at with him in his career. But I also tend to be like, there's a lot of backs. I, I think that about, you know, that I'm, I'm quicker to come to that with running backs than, than most. So but you know, and that's what's that's what's interesting about the price because the market is pricing Josh Jacobs, Derrick Henry, Austin Eckler in yeah. that range. In that, but yeah, the, exactly. They want Barkley. They're partying like it's fucking 2019. He looks like those backs. Like everything about him. And, that's, and, it, that gap is really weird. Why is that gap happening? I don't know, dude. He so his last three seasons yards per out run, 2021 1.02, then 0 0.94, then 0 0.92 last year. Those are. None of those is good. This, anything below one is a red flag. I mean, he hasn't had uh, what he he had one point seven one yards per route run with uh, with thirty five routes in twenty twenty. That was the year he barely played. One point five three back in his rookie season. I mean, that's that's kind of the like the efficient receiver people are thinking about. I think still to an extent. To your point, Ben, like he has more a much higher chance of like just consolidating a backfield. Than most other backs because that's how he's been used his entire career. And if you bring him in, it's like partly to do that. But I mean, it's like I a weird like thing where if he were on the Giants, would he be going here? Like it's almost like people are pricing in an improved situation and when we don't have it yet. Well, he was I, you, when you talk about his really bad receiving stuff, like I, I think it was ADOT has been like negative at times in those years where it's been like it had to be. Not just all yak, but yak plus, you know, like additional. It was yards. two point three last year, which is a career okay, high. It was higher. Yeah. But it yeah, was negative that, that little mini season. That's a career high. It was a year it was negative in twenty twenty two. It was point five in twenty twenty one. That's wild. It was two point three last year. But I do I mean I do in my head at least, I guess, make some excuses for his receiving efficiency based on the offense. I mean, everyone in that passing game had horrible numbers last year. It was just, I mean, their quarterback play was horrible. They took a ton of sacks. Everything was horrible uh, for the Giants. I, I think that the baking in an improved situation 
it, to some degree, you could be like any situation would be better than the Giants. <laughs> the last few years have been pretty bad in New York. Yeah. yeah. But Tommy DeVito played most of the year at quarterback for that team. Do you guys remember how bad it was for the Giants last year? Like, it was gross. Tommy Cutlets, That's true. Baby. Um, yeah, the other thing is, we didn't mention the Chargers, which is right. one of the situations. Like, if he were to go to the Chargers. I love the Texans fit. I, but I that's the this, thing. Like, I, I, then I'll fucking draft why, him. If he's right, on the Chargers, I'll draft him. Then. Because yeah. it's it's Houston Texans. Uh, I just pulled up the uh, the DraftKings sportsbook odds from two days ago. Texans minus two hundred, Chargers plus two eighty five. So the market's basically saying he's going to one of these two spots, and I'm going to feel good about him there. I'm fine taking him at the back That's end true. of round two. Um, Which I, I won't. I will mix in some at the back end of round two. If he's on one of those teams, but he will not be a target for me. Even but on to your guys' points, like if you want to make that bet, like I mean, it's not the same bet. But Josh Jacobs at sixty ADP, Derrick Henry at sixty one, like those names that you guys are talking about, instead of Saquon at twenty three, like, I'm I'm much more comfortable with the this guys is, going this later. Is come, this is how we come full circle, Gretch, Marvin Harrison Jr. or Saquon Barkley at the end of the second <laughs> round. <laughs> That's not even a question to me. I'm taking no. I'm taking Marvin Harrison Jr. There. I can't. That's how we I, had to get you on board. But look, like I'll take Josh Jacobs later to get my guaranteed running back free agent touches, whatever the hell. <laughs> <laughs> why why is the market this frothy on Barkley? He should at least be a fourth rounder. I don't understand. I mean, maybe not the Texans Chargers stuff for sure. Maybe not 60 plus ADP, but like he should still be going at 45, not 23. Like <sighs> yeah. Yeah, I mean his his efficiency just is not good anymore. Like he's he's I mean it's not terrible, but it's just he's at the point where you want I think you want to be a little bit cautious about how much is left in the tank. And yeah, we don't even know where you're gonna be. It's a twenty seven year old back down that much last yeah. year. Sorry? Did no, Stroudy no. protect down that much last year? No, no. No, I mean, he's he's aggressive he, downfield. We love it. He's like the Trevor Lawrence thing we've been talking about with ETN, potentially, where it's just like you're throwing downfield constantly, right? Like, it's yeah. actually bad for running back receiving. ETN's a guy where it's like he's he's locked into a big workload. He's younger. I know he, he was inefficient. Like, we have some efficiency concerns with him outside of the touchdown scoring from last year. But, like, it wasn't a disaster. And then uh, James Cook, another guy who's actually really efficient, Will he get the touchdowns? I don't know. But, like, he's on a Josh Allen offense as the lead back, and he's explosive. So, like, that, those are two guys right there were, yeah. like, yeah. I would rather have both of those guys than Barkley. Yeah. Yep. Well, certainly at their cost. No, just straight up. <laughs> <laughs> just straight up. Barkley's still like I, I still believe that Barkley is a, not a transcendent running back, but a special talent. Like that guy. Remember how when he tested? Like he hasn't necessarily always shown it, but it he would surprise me if he had a legendary season still at this at age twenty. I would. It would very much surprise me. I mean, mm. anytime we have falling efficiency, an aging back, he's leaving the team. The team he was just with is like we're good. Like these are all we know how this goes, man. This this never it sucks. This part sucks, but like we're trying to predict the future. He's not that old. He just turned 27 in February, like a month ago. Like I, what did not, I say? This show coming full circle. Mm-hmm. At some point in this show, we were gonna say a 26 or 27. <laughs> we're trying to predict the future. Draftable. Oh god. <laughs> Boom. We did it, so, guys. You nailed is. that. Uh, okay. Uh, well, who knows? I mean, I think what next week we should have a lot of free agent stuff solidified by this time. Maybe we can uh, we can either break it down or we can uh, get our draft sea legs going uh, together here on ship chasing. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, uh, let's see, Gretch. You said you're finishing up your next targets per uh, route run post here. Yep. Uh, Sean and I still talking about when we're going to start doing bananas again. We've been kind of like ships passing in the night a little bit on our schedules and some of the other things that we're working on. And so that I think will come back next week. But yeah, been been writing the Target Sprout Run stuff, which it's been really uh, good the last couple of years. The, the insights I've had there have been 
like better than some of my August stuff. <laughs> I mean, like I look back on it and I'm like, man, I had a lot of this stuff pegged eventually very correctly in the beginning of the off season. It's nice to uh, uh, grab a lot of the stuff from writing, stealing signals in season and obviously watching all the games and um, trying to bring that context into the, the different pass catchers in the early part of the off season while it's all sort of still fresh. So anyway, I, I like those pieces a lot. Those are probably the most yeah. impactful pieces that I'll write for the next six months or, I mean, for the first six months of the calendar year. So, um, yeah, working through those. Those are fun ones. Nice. I'm excited to dig into those. Pat, did you say you had a QB article coming? Yeah, QB article. I would like to revise my hot take and just say James Cook. I'll take ahead of Barkley straight up. Uh, I'll take, I'll take <laughs> Barkley ahead of ETN. Wow, so. already walking it back. <laughs> already walking it back. But James Cook, I mean, that's that's pretty hot, guys. I mean, that's pretty hot. <laughs> that's, that's um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've got the uh, quarterback articles are, are going to be rolling out first. Um, and I'll, I'll have that out, I think, early next week. I'm recording a podcast tomorrow with Eric Froton of NBC, uh, oh, nice. expert on all the, the rookies, college football gurus. So we're going to be diving into the rookie class there. Also going to be talking with uh, J.J. Zacharyson uh, early next week talking rookies as well so and i'm trying to get something the following week for uh for the free agency period so uh yeah legendary upside podcast check it out wherever you get your podcasts yes also i'm glad casey brought this up i, I know uh gretch was doing the lord's work getting us to land the plane <laughs> on all every, of those uh, few hours because i had on the fucking great is the worst you're not even invited to the omni cup next well, year i mean of all the well, people well, of all the people, like, I mean, good Lord. Every time this guy's on the clock for eight hours. Sorry for living my life. <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to be fun uh, to sweat, though. Every every uh, Omni draft is done, right? Or at least yeah, the Omni yeah. Cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah they finished on, on Monday, the Omni Cup ones. Thanks to everyone who did that for uh, for doing, you know, drafting as fast as they could except Karain. Everyone else who was uh, involved. <laughs> Uh, appreciate all your shout guys. out to Ben for like no Ben's like te- he's like hey man you gotta pick and I don't know like if if you if you're looking for someone like Bangladesh is uh, is a sleeper right now and they're looking real good in cricket I'm like how the fuck do you know what Bangladesh I'm cricket giving is? Him, uh, I'm giving him a list <laughs> of picks so that he doesn't have to do research so he can just, just pick one I, off the list and like all right we'll Bangladesh is a real sleeper to get out of round one of fucking cricket tournament I was like meanwhile was cool. and I, I mean shout I out took them. <laughs> shout out, you did. Shout out Pete, who uh your draft finished a full day before any of the other 19 drafts. You guys are crushing it. Pete wow. never had to be pinged even once, I don't think. But yeah, dude. anyway, yeah, that was that was a blast. That definitely uh labor of love. But um we got all 19 drafts in the books. The the Champions League stuff already started. We got all that stuff's coming in hot and heavy in, in March. We got college basketball, all that. So it'll be fun to track yeah, that nice. stuff too. Um couple things for me i'm doing after dark show on my channel for youtube members on saturday night uh tej seth from sumer sports so uh have been you know mixing in guests uh that i know really well i had jj on last week and then sometimes guests i've never done shows with so excited for the one uh with tej and then i've been in the lab on a deposit kingdom video that's my other uh youtube channel where there's like the week 17 is all that matters video all about scrolling the f down the term coined by our friends over at the badge bros and how we can potentially apply it to season long drafts uh brick recently uh called his shot said this is going to be the meta of 2024 drafting summer and i said all right uh let's will this into existence trying to see uh what we could potentially do talk to sacrilegious a little bit been looking at data and uh yeah keep an eye out for that over on the deposit kingdom youtube channel Uh, hopefully early mid next week yeah but putting a ton of time into this one so please watch it when it drops um this was very fun to get in uh back in the saddle or should i say back on this sinking ship with all of you we'll see you guys next <laughs> slower week. than the other sinking ships <laughs>